Welcome to Carito Connects. I'm your host, Jen, and I've been conversing with friends around the world about life challenges and impactful moments. Conversations on this platform look at answering the questions, how we overcome challenges and how our experiences shape who we are and the work we do today. I hope this work can inspire you on your own personal and individual journey. Let's dive right in. Hello, my guest today is Hong Kong-based Delia Leung, founder of 108 Yoga Studio. Delia is a Dharma yoga teacher, Nike Hong Kong yoga trainer and representative, co-founder of Mindful Movement, a platform that promotes mindfulness practices in Hong Kong. Hi, Delia, and welcome to Carito Connects. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm so honored to call Delia a friend and sensei since we connected back at the old uh, boutique yoga studio in Hong Kong called Blue Door uh, that my friend Tamara took me to, I would say about uh, back in 2015, 2016. Um, And I think Delia and I have really only met in person five times or not even, maybe less. Uh, But, you know, thanks to social media and Hong Kong and Taiwan's very close. So we managed to keep in touch. And I recently had the honor to attend her first international yoga retreat at Nanzinji Temple in Kyoto. Um, oh, there's so much to say, Delia, but I, <laughs> I'm just so happy you're here. Uh, it took us a while to um, connect to do this recording, so I, I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> Today, Julia really, would love to share with us how she chose to leave the finance world and enter the wellness space in Hong Kong. And so without further ado, Delia, let me have you introduce your humble beginnings with our listeners and how you ended up walking down the spiritual path, sharing your love for yoga with those in Hong Kong. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you so much for this introduction. Um, uh, let me see how to start. <laughs> Every time when people invite me in to talk about my life and the transition, <laughs> it's almost like yesterday that happened. So I have been um, in finance for around six to seven years before becoming a full-time yoga teacher. And back then, um, it was actually a really enjoyable journey. So I, just like other bankers, um, I was all more on the public side. So I was working on a trading floor, trading something called the credits. (laughs) And like other young ones back in the days, I would use, um, I was, I would use the term use yoga asanas to keep fit, to hang out with my friends on the yoga mat before happy hour or after happy hour. And that was the fun part of becoming um, a yoga practitioner back in the days. And um, I would say the transition started when I was around 30, maybe 29, that I was thinking about to gift myself a proper and more serious gift to dive and also to deepen the knowledge on yoga. So that time I was like, hey, I've been to so many workshops, I've been to so many classes or to talks or conferences, what else shall I do? And as a member of a yoga fitness center, it's always like going into a class, you know, how you practice on the yoga mat, you sweated so much and you felt so great from inside and you felt like you're sweating from all parts of skin and you felt like all of a sudden you need to eat only hummus and avocado after the class. And, you know, but there was, I'm sure there was something deeper than that. And there must be something that fascinated me so much that kept me going, but not something else like running or, or mobility work. Um, so I delved into some research on yoga teachers training. And of course, I wasn't planning, at, I wasn't at all in my head to wanting to become a yoga teacher. Like, I, I believe there are a few yoga teachers outside, out there also had similar, similar stories, to be honest. And I... I was keep reminding myself, okay, not don't go in a rush and just to pick whoever which is available that time, but you really have to step onto the yoga mat and to see and feel. More importantly is to feel whether you resonate with the person. So it's just like dating a guy <laughs> or finding your date is not only about the food, but it's also about the feeling over the food. Um, so I was thinking 
maybe this guy or maybe that guy. Um, then I ended up with a training in Hong Kong at the beginning, and I, that was really value added, and I enjoyed a lot. But during the training, which is normally we started with two hundred hours, there were some very interesting topics that I would constantly, perhaps unconsciously, falling asleep, <laughs> or the other parts of the topics that were really excited me, and almost like giving me some heartbeat sensation. So the relatively more interesting parts or topics that I I had heartbeats on are the philosophy part, the pranayama, which is the breath work, and also the storytelling about some Gita or Sanskrit or scriptures, or just something that it is beyond the body movement. So I was just talking to myself, wow, how come this mantra or chanting? Before I know what they mean, already touched my heart so much that made me tear. And back then, you did not know what is happening. You just, you just wanted to dodge that feeling, or avoid to become vulnerable, um, become become the odd one that teared in the class among the fifty of us. But the more I was in the training, the more I was really、um, allowing myself to feel in from the heart. And that time, I was telling myself, "Okay, this is not what I was thinking. There must be something more. So I should look out and to see what's out there." So after the first two hundred hours teacher training, I was still a banker back then.、Um, but perhaps I would also give credit to my first degree, which is a bachelor in science in psychology. So I did it in UCL University College London, and I was a nerd. Okay. <laughs> Out of so many topics, I realized and noticed that something about the mind and the brain would fascinate me. So that was when I had to write my、um, thesis <clears throat> to do hypothesis on、um, body movement in relation to memory, in relation to、um, perception, which is how you look at things. That was the fascinating part. So I would like go to the lab and do research. I will look at the brain scan, the wavelength, and to write reports. I and, did not know this、um, about you. <laughs> <laughs> I was also really honored to get a paper published with my professor on this topic. Wow! So it's more about the concept of neuroscience. <laughs> so that I was like trying to puzzle and put different pieces of the puzzle together and to see and to check in with myself. How come I never had this feeling when I was working on the trading floor?、Mm. Something that I wasn't looking for an output, I wasn't looking for a return, but I was constantly hungry about that. Okay.、Mm. So in Hong Kong, when you're working in banking, when you're in working in public side, you were mandatory were asked to go to two weeks holiday by the SFC so that. Um, it is for the the money laundering and stuff like that. So I was happened to be I happened to be in New York, and you know everyone in New York. What what do you normally do? You go to check out the galleries. You check out the wine and dine experience. You also of course check out the shopping malls and shop and shop and shop. Okay. What? <laughs> so I was also、sure? like. <laughs> <laughs> But I always check out the yoga studio. <laughs> <laughs> and I was also just came back from Yellowstone camping and also Hawaii、um, diving and surfing、um, experiences. And in New York, I and also back then with my friend, we were like, "Hey, so why don't we just go and to do some studio hopping, and to check out the yoga scene in New York and how this is different from Hong Kong." And that was the first time I was practicing yoga, more on the asana, which is the yoga postures, overseas. What year? So I went to A、this? and B. Oh, that was two thousand sixteen. Okay. Oh my god, <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> and I went to this school called the Dharma Yoga School, and I had no expectation. I was just like you know, like how autopilot you check out one and then the other one, and you figure out okay, Flatiron Chelsea, perfect location on that day for my itinerary. So I just went. So I went up 
and I was looking at the at the center. I was like, "Wow, okay, is this what you call a school?" And back then, really shameful. I had so much judgment inside me, and I went like, "There's no shower. You had to pay one dollar for a water bottle. You also have to pay a dollar to rent a yoga mat." Okay, so this is how New York works, I guess. And inside, there were no like. Are you serious? There's no towel given, and there were no.、Um, I guess I was just really spoiled in Hong Kong. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I'm thinking, perhaps, yeah, I'm thinking you're like, oh, what? It's like not a beautiful studio, very Instagrammable, where the mat is all laid out, the towel is next to the mat. You just you just show up and walk in, and there's like Dyson hair dryers in the shower room. You're like, what is this studio? Anywhere in New York yeah, City, <laughs> and unisex too. Okay, there's no men's toilet and women's toilet for your information. <laughs> so I put my bag. And there were no locker too, so it's really of an honest system. So you trust your bag would not be stolen, and you put it on a rack in New York, in Manhattan. Okay, so、Clearly、I went into the studio. This place, you were drawn <laughs> to this place for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I went in.、Um, it was huge, and it's just like this energy is.、Uh, I don't know how to. Describe is I still remember vividly. It's like zoom inside me. It's like、um, on fire, but that fire is like from my solar plexus and also around my、um, dantian. It's like warm and fussy, but powerful. So I chose a place. I remember like a few rows back, by the pillar, by the window, and that was summertime. And I was just waiting for Dama to come in. Who is now my very respected teacher, who changed my life.、Um, he's now eighty-four now this year, and back then he was like late seventies. He came in, walked slowly. He came in with his dog. I was like, okay, this is the first time I also saw a dog in yoga in the shala. So I, I sat down and I was looking at looking at other people warming up. Everyone was really humble, and by means of humble, the energy or the sensation of humbleness came out from how they warm up. You know how in some studios, or I don't know, it's like a it's it's like the energy or the vibration that people gives you. Some people before they speak to you, you 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 they they may strike it as、um, pretty ambitious or unfriendly, right? So. Vice versa, some people come in as very humble and they are very surrendering. I really like the term surrendering. So they just do whatever they the body tells them to do, and this is like the glimpse of my observation before the class starts. People wear very humble clothes by means of humble. They were no branded. They were not like wearing a lot of bling bling on the neck or their ears. They were just like properly doing what truly what warm up is. And some would just sit down and close their eyes and meditate to warm up their mind or the heart. So Dharma came in.、Um, I was expected, and I was looking for to stand up and to warm up or to om, and we started from normal salutation, right? But no one moved. They were just all sitting down quietly. Some opened their eyes, some closed their eyes, and he started to do this discourse. The Dharma talk. So I was like, in my mind, I was like, 好，那我就看看他有什么东西可以给我 okay? So <laughs> I was closing my eyes. I was also looking, looking at him, and I felt like that that ten minutes were actually talking to me. It's like it's like to me and for me, and even now when I mention that, I would get really sentimental. So he started to talk about the karma and the reincarnation, and to talk about like how we, by law of attraction, everything is perfect, and everything should be really starting from the vibration from the heart. And that time, I was like tearing like crazy, and my friend next to me, he was like, "Wow, how come you're so pretentious?" <laughs> Wow! So, 
because we were like in a very playful and we were on holiday, right? So he he did not do it on purpose. I know that by fact, but he was just really surprised that the words or whatever came out from Dharma's mouth could really touch my heart in such a deep level.、Mm. And、um, that time I was like, oh my god, I I really don't know. I was like, shit, I caught me tearing, and I actually did not know that. And、um, he was trying to ask me how to justify those tears after class, and I really had no words for that. Yeah, and that was just like really in the heart. And so the asana、awesome、class started, and it was like a two-hour class, which is completely satisfying.、Um, on another plan. Yeah. So we we took a picture with him, of course, <laughs> like a little fan. Um, and I went to him and say, "Hey, Dama, this is my first time meeting you. Can I take a picture with you?" It's just like a ball of love. It is like um, as if a lot of love radiating out from him, and also gratitude. Um, so I I went back again the day after that day, and also the day after the day. So it's like three days in a row. Um, so the last class was called something called the Yoga Nidra. I was asking some classmates back in the days. I did not know what that is.、Um, so they were like, "One said, 'You don't know what Yoga Nidra is, Delia. Oh my God, it's really profound. You pay and you go to sleep. Okay." And I was like, "Cracking what? <laughs> Cracking up?" I was like, "What are you talking about?" And that really. You know, like that kind of sense of duality, or the judgment, or just justification mindset of a city girl just kicked in again. And I was asking, "You paid and you sleep? This is not justifiable." Okay, I'd rather go and have a smoothie. But somehow, I just went back again, and I still remember when I signed up on Mind Body. I was like, "Okay, fine, I'll just sign up. Okay, whatever that is." So I went back. And that was the last time I saw Dharma before、I、completely turned myself into a yoga teacher, and I... that yoga teacher was profound. <laughs> <laughs> I love、uh, I love how you just went on the flow,、um, but in between <laughs> I had many questions, so I want to kind of stop you,、uh, take a little intermission there,、um, and kind of rewind us back a little bit.、Um, I'm I'm gonna just. Ask,、uh, and you can choose to answer as you wish.、Uh, I wanted to, so I wanted to go back to the beginning when you were introducing yourself, and just to clarify,、um, you were born and raised in Hong Kong, yes. And I、mm-hmm. wanted to ask,、um, so you did all your schooling in Hong Kong、uh, until you went to ULC at、uh, UCL for、um, uni.、Mm-hmm. At, then you study psychology, as you mentioned. Then I was curious, like, how did that end up? Being you going into banking, so like, what was that correlation? As in, like, how you chose、okay. that career path, right? Like, and、um, just speaking openly, you know, not trying to stereotype, but it's very common in Asian households.、Uh, I'm sure, like yourself and myself here in Taiwan, you know, at, in that generation,、uh, you know, we're we're '80s kids, but it's like, yeah, you go to school, you get a degree, and ideally, you either choose a path in You know, law or medicine or、um, finance, etc. Which I did not do any, but <laughs> but I, I'm just curious, like how you, you know, for instance, like did you stay? Like why not stay in London? Why did you choose to come back to Hong Kong?、Um, and so that was the first one. Then I wanted to transition into when you said、um, you. You know your balance between work and your free time was you went to the studios, like you went to yoga. How did you find yoga as a practice?、Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, from our small talks before, I believe you said your mom was the one who introduced you to yoga practice. And then to give people more background about you, you're also a ballerina, right? Like you, you danced growing up. Um, mm. Just so that people have that understanding when they look at your yoga photos, and they're like, <laughs> "What? <laughs> She's folding herself into a pretzel." <laughs>、um, so I, I think that I just wanted to put that out there because I think that's quite fundamental to understanding、um, your heart space from a 
from your early days as a child, that movement was quite a big part of you um, and, and exposure from your, from your mom. Um, and then I, and then my last one before I, I give you the mic again for you to answer these questions was when you chose to um, you know, walk into Dharma studio in New York and like you illustrated, you know, you, you kind of just went in, didn't really know what to expect, was kind of judgy or was judgy about what you saw, which I can completely relate and understand too. Um, and then, but you were so moved by everything you experienced there. And like your friend who asked you, you know, wow, you know, so pretentious, why are you crying and kind of not challenging you, but just asking you to kind of dig deeper to understand what's happening like what are these triggers and I'm sure at the time you didn't have the tools to be able to understand or answer and now in hindsight you know we're almost almost hitting a decade you said 2016 so not quite yet but almost a decade since you walked into you know walked into Dharma studio what do you think it was that triggered you to feel like that 10 minute you know, philo philosophical talk he gave um, was so profound for you, you know, like what were you going through at the time? Because I think you probably can answer that now, right? Like in hindsight now, like what were you going through at the time that clearly you were, you know, in, in conflict with maybe in your life, you know, like where you felt like, wow, I really feel home here. Like, I really feel like Dharma is speaking to my heart, you know, that I, I'm, I'm struggling between maybe at the time, and I don't know, you, you can answer this, but I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe it was like work, maybe it was like family stuff, maybe it was relationships that you felt like, wow, he sees right through you and that, you know, you feel like, okay, I'm going to start making changes. Um, so anyway, so those are kind of the questions I was going through in my head when you were... <laughs> when you were sharing with us earlier and I wanted to be like, wait, 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 I'm raising my hand. I want to ask some more questions. So I will leave you to it. Um, however you want to uh, answer, feel free to. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so perhaps let's start from the, the psychology to finance. That's a very uh, legit question. Um, so given that I was very drawn to psychology, I came back to Hong Kong University to work for the dean in the psychology department. And um, I was also choosing between Hong Kong and also stay in London to continue um, the subjects in relation to this big department. Um, and however, I, I would also say um, back in the days, globally, um, the awareness or the consciousness about the inner work or the psychology is there. However, whether the for political reason, for environmental reason, for economical, um, for I would say it evenly is spread across the whole world. Whether the funding and also for for the university's research funding, whether they are they are well supported is another thing. Um, so given that my my interest is a little bit. I wouldn't say a little bit, but it's, it's not as niche now, but back in the days, I would say it's quite niche in Hong Kong. Um, it's like the the very end, I still remember the doors at the very end of the whole entire department, because it's a call center, think about it, like in psychology, it's always about clinical, it's about counseling psychology or psychology therapy, it's like more about helping people to become better or become who they are as an authentic self. But research, especially on the cognitive science, is always on the cost side. Um, so that time I was telling myself, maybe I can come back in a bit. I also was eyeing on another um, uh, joint program. Not sure whether it still, it still exists now, but that back in the days there was a joint program between UCL and Harvard, I would believe. So that one was more on the Jungian side, which talks more about the subconscious level and the dreams. Um, so I was like, okay, maybe I can do an MPhil later, or maybe I can do a master later. I always believe that there's no rush or don't rush into things. When it is not the right timing, just 
don't try to push or or work and live countercurrent. I mean, this somehow has always have been in my in my head for the longest time. Um, so for ballet, I started ballet since four. I would say this is definitely part of me now. The even the way how I walk or the way how I move on my yoga mat, people can somewhat definitely can resonate and relate into ballet discipline. So my mom definitely is a person who I need to, and I will thank her for life、um, to bring me to my first yoga class. I still remember I was in summer holiday in A levels, so I came back to Hong Kong. I wasn't in any fitness. I did not have any fitness membership back then, and then she went like, "Hey, why don't you just come to a yoga class with me?" And we went into a, into a teacher's house, and for sure yoga wasn't like this、um, back in the day. So it was more discreet. This is more.、Um, it's like if you know, you know that kind of thing. So I went into the room. I was practicing literally by the teacher's refrigerator, and the refrigerator was around my height. And when I was doing a warrior three, I was like, "Oh my god, I'm about to kick into the fridge," and that was the most unpleasant moment one hour in my life. So in my head, I felt like now you brought up and you asked, it made me think that sixty minutes. I felt like a lot of,、um, you know, the struggle or inner talks or there was just a lot of conversation or dialogues, like inner dialogues going on in my head. I was like looking at the fridge. I was looking at the mat. I was also looking at my body, looking at my facial expression, looking how high the leg of the person next to me. So in a way, I wasn't mindful at all, and I was also comparing myself to the woman next to me, whoever that was. Then I started to notice, wow, this very boring discipline is costing is is causing me to think and also causing my mind to just like nonstop going through a lot of things, and is really unpleasant. And also, you know how everyone、um, been been through the twenty late early twenties, we love pretty things and. Ballerina wear very pretty tutu. We wear very beautiful makeup. We put foundations on when we are on swan leg foundation on the chest, foundation on the back, on your arm to make sure we look white. And we have the most, we have the biggest stage ever. You are trying to run across with a lot of periods,、uh, meaning turns. From one corner to another, but now I only have a mat. Okay. <laughs> but I down. Love this, I love I this description. <laughs> I love this description. It's just a lot of com. It's just a lot of comparison, you know, and also a lot of、um, discrimination back in the days. <laughs>、um, but one beautiful thing now I notice yoga is it's never a competition. It's also never a competition, especially between you and anyone else. You can keep track on your、um, asana practice. You can keep track on your meditation practice. Any form of practice within you, but you can never. For example, there's there's no way that we can host a meditation competition. This is just not making any sense.、Um, so I guess yoga is really now becoming. My life, or I would say, I am equal to yoga. Not even part of my life, but I would say it. It is my life that I I appreciate the me time on a different level and also from a different perspective. And that also、um, leads to the next question that you you were asking about. So, what was happening that moment when I was in Dharma Center? Um. I actually thought about that for many years. You know, <laughs> from time to time, I would take out that from my memory box and try to, to,、uh, just to run it again in my mind. I try to make it as precise or try to zoom in into that moment as much as I can. But at the end of the day, I realize 
is it even important it's not important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so as i as i share my yoga teaching nowadays with students i was also saying to a lot of you guys is it really important to take out what is exactly happening or why you cry or why you tear we love to justify things or we love to give reasons because this is how the modern days and in our society, especially in, let's say, in Hong Kong, in Taipei, cosmopolitan cities, we love reasonings. We love to give bullet points so that we feel better to see points and we, we feel better. It looks good on the result or in the data on, you know, basically it's analytics. But is it really important to know what exactly is let go or what is exactly shred mm, maybe not even more so i would say like the whole whole entire yoga yoga practice or this discipline it totally is a way of reducing it's just like one one layer of onion one layer it got peeled off and then the other onion layer got peeled off so you peel, 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 keep peeling, peeling until you got the juicy heart of an onion. And that's, and that's the most beautiful part of everyone's soul is the soul, is, is the true authentic soul self, right? We tend to think about gaining more knowledge. Let's say I go to a class to learn how to play golf. You, th you think about what clubs you want to buy, which course you're going into, how many, how much, how many yards, is this a three hole or is it a five hole? You think about a lot of things and you're trying to gain and that's what the technicality comes in. But going back to the principle, it's not gaining, but it's de-gaining. You're, you're peeling off so you can become who you are. And this is the beauty of yoga. Mm. Mm. Wow, so deep, so deep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do have to, I'm sorry, but I do have to go back and say, wait, but you didn't quite explain how you ended up with a psychology degree working at a bank. Oh, yeah. And then I wanted to then ask you, um, then, okay, then from there, you can tell us how you went back to Dharma, right? And then did your whole training mm -hmm. with him and obviously fell completely in love with this path. And then at that juncture, sure. how did you say, <laughs> hi, mom and dad, not that you have to report to them, but just kind of like, hi world, like, like I'm done with finance, I'm shifting into this space. And we're talking about mid 2000s, right? So we're talking about like 2017-ish, 20, 2017-18-ish, where, um, the wellness sector existed, but wasn't, it's not as big as it is today, right? So you're entering a space in Hong Kong that is kind of new, right? Like it's like, it's, I mean, not that new, but just because at, at that time, there was already the um, Asia Yoga Conference that they've been doing for many years. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, there is a presence there, but just, um, you know, how did you navigate that space? So finance, mm -hmm. you know, announcing to the world you're... <laughs> You're changing your identity, so to speak. <laughs> Not changing, you're, you are being your authentic self. <laughs> <laughs> then I had to talk about my, my law studies. So I, when, when I decided not to go back to Hong Kong and then stayed in London, I was like, okay, maybe take one more year to study something, okay, just something. And straight in my head, like coming out from a traditional Chinese family, I was like, okay, maybe law, law must fit into something. Law must be something nice to look at. Law must be something that would make my parents proud of. And I don't forget that I was a nerd back then. So it's relatively quite easy for me to get into a law school. <laughs> or more 90% by luck, 10% by hard work. So I was in law school for a year. And it's, it's a slightly different from uh, studying Juris Doctor in the US. Um, so in, in, in London, it was only a one-year program, but you also had to do European law, blah, 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 blah. Um, and that was very intellectually provoking. And I really like, I really enjoyed the 
analytical work and also the writing part. But when I came back to Hong Kong and worked for a law firm, I was in trust and probate department, handling with a lot of divorce cases, <laughs> trust cases, and also family disputes. And you will be surprised every time when I go into a high court, when I saw my client cry, I would cry with them. <laughs> so until one day, my partner was like, dude, okay, I know that you're a very empathetic person, but you cannot cry with them. <laughs> you are hired to help us to draft things, to draft documents, but not becoming very emotional. So I was very emotionally involved and also as an empath, I would say, um, I, it feels like I was, I also was starting to become aware that the commercial side of the case is not as fascinating as the emotional side of the case. Mm. Then I was, I actually had struggled a bit. I was, I was wondering, and also I, I really sat down for quite some time with myself to see what I would like to become. Um, and that time also, I was lucky enough to, um, got offered by a job in, in, in banking. Um, I started to just start from preparing interviews from scratch. I did not know anything about trading floor, of course. So I read, prepared, do research and went on from one interview to, I forgot how many. So I got the job very unemotional emotional in the sense of course you have excitement on the floor you have um, um, hyper or heated moments or angry moments or frustrated moments in the market of course but um, it's not those kind of lingering sensation when you're handling with trust and probate cases so that kind of emotions I, is easier for me to deal with or more like now in hindsight it's more like easier for me to suppress or easy me to pass right but when i really relate myself to wow she's divorcing her husband and in relation to a big draft in prenup that kind of thing is more about human connection and that kind of com emotions back then it was hard for me to absorb and also to digest um yeah so unemotional <laughs> And that was, that's why I was in finance. And of course, after coming back from New York, it was really interesting. That, that I think I need I need to I need to um, mention this in in a recording. Um, so the moment when I left the center, I was telling the center receptionist, "Hey, Joanne, I'm leaving. So nice meeting you." And she went like, "Hey." There's a 500 hours teacher's training coming up this September. Are you interested? And that time my banking mode kicked in again. I was like, who does this? You know, I'm from Hong Kong. This is the, the this is one of the worst pitch of business you, I can get. And there's no way I would come back for this training. And you should, you should market this training to someone behind me who is from Ohio, but not from not me okay i'm the last person you should you should market and somehow don't ask me why and how i came back to hong kong but i really checked in with my heart so i looked at my boss who is a who was a lady she's not a lot older than me and she has a lot on her shoulders about to promote to head of the securities blah 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 and i looked at her and asked myself do i want to become her in the future and it's a straight no from my heart so there was i would say there was a lot of like inner dialogue between me the physical me and the physical heart or more like now i would understand as the spiritual heart there's so many there's so many questions that you would ask yourself in life then normally when you answer those questions with mind, they always, most of the cases would have different answers compared to answering from the heart. So that time it was a strong no shooting out from my heart and I was like, okay, so I guess it's done. So I resigned um, 
of course, everyone was shocked. I was also about to get promoted, I believe. <laughs> and、um, they were also offered me a sabbatical or even switching team to CEO office. So that I don't, they were like, okay, are you are you more concerned about flying? Are you not comfortable at、um, looking after clients anymore? You know, so all these options, I, I also declined.、Um, yeah, so I went back to New York, and that's how my journey started.、Mm. <laughs> Did you find that it was difficult for you at the time to make that leap, like to to make that decision? Um, or was it quite? Do you feel like you really followed your heart space and was like, I don't care if my family doesn't approve. I don't care if my social circle thinks I'm, you know, becoming a hippie and going down this path.、Um, because I, I, the reason I ask is because I think many people who tr- who want to do that transition fear that, right? Like they they there is this fear element of like, but I really want to. Go down this path. How will I support myself? You know, like I will not get, quote unquote, approval from society, the society they recognize,、uh, to do this, right? And then, how do you find that courage to be like, but my heart space really is calling me towards this, and that it will be okay? Because once you open that door and shut another door. Many more doors will open, right? But it's always in again, it's always in hindsight. You won't really know that until you walk the path. So I just was wondering for you personally,、um, what, how was that experience? So if you notice, all the questions were really legit that you asked, but all the questions I would say is very、um, three dimensional. It's very physical, right? And that time I really did not think too much. I, I guess I was so in my Heart space, space、yeah. that all those questions did not even come across,、That's、like the、great. money, the whether it's a safe choice or what am I going to do next, which studio I'm going to teach. None of those were in my mind. I just were like, oh, I got a chance in six weeks' time. I can still come back、uh, for the September training. I do not want to wait for another year, which is two thousand seventeen. So I need to do this now. It's like very clear message in my head. I need to do this now,、hmm. and the rest I can put aside as long as I can sustain myself financially. Of course, I also still have to think about okay whether it is okay realistically. Then、um, I just quit. But it's interesting that you asked.、Um, there was this moment. I I got panic or or anxious a little bit. It was when that time when I handed back in my BlackBerry to my secretary, okay, and the door shut, and also the I also had to pass her back my pass, my entry pass on the floor, and I still remember so vividly that moment. I was like, "Whoa, okay, I guess this really is it." The this banging sound of the door. the the last touch of the BlackBerry and the last time when I look at the clock, you know, it's really funny on on the ceiling there were so many different clocks in different in different zones, okay, <laughs> and that was the last time I look at those clocks and I was like, okay, this is it. And the next morning, I woke up at around six as usual, but it was also very. It really hit me when I turned on the news on Bloomberg, but nothing, what Obama said matches to me anymore. It felt like I was complete. I I was not needed in the market anymore, and I also got taken away the BlackBerry and the Bloomberg terminal. And before I quit, there was a. There was one afternoon. It was, I I guess some of the. Finance people may also remember there was this one afternoon the Bloomberg terminal was out globally for a few minutes, and that was actually a realization for me. That time everyone stopped working, some turned to check out people's profile on LinkedIn, okay, to kill time, <laughs> and some people were like talking to clients on WhatsApp and on other or other platform. Then it really hit me in the heart in the sense that 
re rely on technology or we we communicate it with a technology and when it is dead it's we are almost like handicapped so i was thinking okay so my my skill set is not as transferable as i think or more importantly is so what do we do if we retire one day and it was just it was a thing moment and i i was like wow i look at the screen but i couldn't do anything so it's as of now i do not have both arms so what is happening now and what are we going to do after it got retrieved and so there were so many questions inside me and of course i did not share with my boss back in the days but you know that moment is really quite a realization moment for me too mm. Mm. great segue to my next question for you <laughs> because i wanted to ask you um like you said it was very clear like transition and marker for you and because you were so in tune with your heart space those noises really did not um kind of i guess affect you as much as i think a lot of us would be and i'm speaking for myself <laughs> you know like in terms of like making those transitions and not really caring about the noises right or you know so I think what you said earlier was so true, like really, really tap into your heart space, which is very, very hard, um, especially if for those of us living in, in big cities, which leads me to want to ask you, um, when you chose to come back to Hong Kong with your 500 hours from Dharma, how did you... How did you see what was going to happen next, I guess, for you, right? You have this, you have this, uh, you know, you're now certified to teach and you've chosen this path. And I think, like I said earlier, I think at the time in Hong Kong, this whole like, you know, boutique yoga studio, the wellness sector was just kind of slowly becoming more, if I can use the word commercialized, right? In that, I don't even know if Lululemon was already there at that time, but just, you know, the space was slowly growing. And so I think I'm just curious for you, like, how did you feel coming back? Like how you wanted to position yourself in the space, right? Were you like, I'm going to stay in Hong Kong and then, you know, build myself up here, teach at, you know, teach at different studios or open your own studio or, you know, you're like, I miss London. So I want to go to London. Like, you know, how did you, I guess, can I say like execute? <laughs> How did you go with the flow of like the next steps from there? <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, coming back uh, from my training, it was so profound and overwhelming. Again, none of this question exists that moment. And I was just like still sobbing in and like absorbing and, and trying to sink in what was happening for in, in those 500 hours. Because I, I truly understand that I also have shifted a lot, like from as obvious as diet. I, I, I was a vegetarian, a very straight vegan for a long time. Um, and that already changed my lifetime, life, lifestyle and also the way how I interact with my parents for a lot. Um, so the cooking and the kitchen placing everything, I had to like, hey, mom. This is now how it works now, okay? <laughs> so I, I also have to go home and to explain to them why I'm doing this, why I'm doing that. And there's just a lot of like explaining. And, and I guess I was so, um, it was just so straightforward and so natural for me. I wanted to convey those shifts and also messages to them through very naturally and organically. So I did not really even like plan or how to win the win the trust or trying to gain um, the Hong Kong society's approval, none of those. I was trying to like slowly by slowly, bit by bit. As you know, as, as a friend and also teacher, I'm always like that, like trying to like just convey. And people really can feel whether it's from your mind and from your heart, they really can. Um, it's just like going into a yoga class when they say exactly the same cue, exact same cue, let's say, you you know who is reciting from a paper and who is 
coming out from from their own the teacher's body, right? So those are my, I would say my my tactics or my drills to to also share my shift to my parents. And I I came back and I was like, Dad, I think I'm done with banking for now. Um, and I, I know that like if I wanted to go back to banking, I can always go back to banking. You know, maybe not now, okay, but back in the days, maybe just a few months, you know, taking breaks is really common for people to take breaks, right? So it's always quite nice to, to have a fresh mind if I really decide to go back to banking. Um, so he wasn't really as strict and he did not even say it much. But then slowly, um, I started to give out um, a charity class in parks with a few girls and coming back to Hong Kong, I, I just felt bad to, to ask for tuition fee. I was so new and I felt bad for asking for money just to put people into downward facing dog, okay? So uh, there was a lot of like charity classes in the park until one day um, my becoming my very dear friend now, Annie Wu. So I was stopping her class in a boutique studio in, in Hong Kong. And that's how I slowly, slowly gain confidence. And also, so, so the how easy to, 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 to get money, get paid to teach. Mm. Oh, I, I love, uh, I love how you, you, um, you illustrated that whole process because I think the key point from how you just described that was through action. And it sounds so simple, <laughs> but really, really <laughs> just do your own action because through your own action, if it really comes from the heart with pure intentions, it will resonate to those around you. And I think that that is exactly what you did. And I think that's exactly uh, what we need to be reminded of more and more so. Um, so I will not continue to pry on the question of like, well, then how did you figure out how to like position yourself in the marketplace and this and that? Because I think uh, we now know it was really just through action and with alignment, one thing just led to another. And here we are today where you did eventually through COVID times uh, start your own studio. And then also the different projects you've been collaborating with over the last few years. And because I want to be mindful of our time, I know there was a topic that you and I both were very excited to kind of tap into a little bit. And it's very relevant to um, 2023. So I want to touch base about that topic very quickly before we wrap up with my concluding questions. But it's about... <laughs> the technology we're in these days and how mindfulness practice and everything you just talked about earlier, heart space, action, um, is very important in the offerings you give and the teachings you give. Uh, as simple as saying, you know, even the shift you're entering this year in 2023, where it's not just about the physical asana practice, it's not just about pranayama breath work, it's not just about the Bhagavad Gita and the philosophy, like yoga philosophy and how to apply it into your day to day, but just in general, like, um, you know, living, right? And, and we, we talked about technology because, you know, nowadays with AI and chat GPT, and just the hustle and bustle. And I think Hong Kong as a marketplace um, is a very good example because it's so busy. There's so many things going on. How do we find <laughs> quietness in such a dynamic place where there's just so much noise um, in small spaces, right? Like, because I think one of the beautiful things, which when I talk to people about the retreat that you held recently in Kyoto, was I said, I loved how we stayed on property in the temple, which was so sacred and so special. And then you felt like you were part of the temple and that, you know, you could wake up early in the morning and take a walk when it's a touristic site, you know, but at the same time, it was like, it felt like it was your backyard because we were staying on property, <laughs> right? And that's not something you can easily get in a city like 
Hong Kong or Taipei or I don't know Singapore. Yes, there are gardens, man-made gardens. You know, but it's it's the energetic level is not the same. And as you love to say in your classes, also it's you know, mo- like the Mother Earth and the land, right? Give thanks to the land. That's first and foremost. So I, I just um, yeah, I wanted to hear your thoughts on how what's going on in the world today <laughs> is and so vital the offerings you're giving um, and why it's important for people to. Uh, apply these ancient practices sure so it's it's interesting that i had a conversation with my brother maybe a year ago during pandemic i was still flying a lot relatively quite a lot compared to most of the people in the world i would say especially in asia Um, i was in in london for quite some time attending to uh, attending his wedding two years ago and I, i was also in italy doing retreats um, learning from one another in my in my sangha, which is the community. Um, so one day, my brother was like, "Hey, you know, there's a lot of movements in in um, in in Hong Kong. Some people move out, some people move in, due to many reasons, social reasons. Have you thought about coming and live in Hong in London like us?" And that time, I was like, "Hmm, interesting question." But somehow, I don't think I'm done with Hong Kong yet. Although Hong Kong, like you mentioned, is so s- relatively small and there are so many, so many things to do. And one beautiful thing about Hong Kong is you can do, you can go to six events per night, okay, or even more. You can just like hop from one restaurant to another event, to another opening or to another class within the same night, which you cannot, of course, you can't do that in, in, in New York or in London. It is not common. And my brother also mentioned something like in London, you get to choose the pace of life. It's not about how successful you are, but you can choose whether you want that day to become very fast paced or you can also slow down as long as you're an entrepreneur like myself. In Hong Kong, you do many things a day, but in London, mostly you do one thing per day. But that one thing, you do it very, very well. And that really hit me and it got me thinking. He is actually right. In London, it's big. Oh my God, everyone was out for coronation, okay? And there was a coronation holiday nowadays. <laughs> and you can, so, you can do a lot of sightseeing. You can always go to Paris. It's so convenient for you. But he is so right. In London, you do that one thing very well and for that very one day and this is a very different mindset from hong kong citizen or although we are both in cosmopolitan cities and at the end of the day like the land you mentioned or the motherland of the of the temple that piece of land i would call it the oasis in in the heart and different people have different shape different size of the oasis some oasis is very far away from the heart. And some are closer, the distance is shorter. In my mind, I always say, I always would put it like the analogy, analogy as we are creating our own oasis in our way, at our own pace, in different form. My mother, take as an example, she's a Chinese calligrapher. So her pen and her penmanship and her brush strokes is her oasis. And that's her active meditation. I never ever say people must do yoga. And when we say yoga in modern society, we always, most of the time, we refer to the asana practice. But yoga could be something very lively. It's like sharing or dropping a, a wisdom over a drink, over a glass of wine could also be a yoga. And it's really completely different from how yoga posture is. Like we have to be very strong in a headstand. So pranayama is always the the exercise I go to, which is the breathing, the breath work. And as long as we are filled in our cup, we can always share more. And I completely um, uh, support the idea of love can be expanded. And it just comes in infinity when your cup is full 
and how breath work can relate to that is because by breathing you become mindful and it's not about how flexible or how strong you are but everyone has to breathe in life so if a quality of our breathing increases how the 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 heart becomes more settling and become more still and this is when we can become calmer when we make decisions and then it will lead to one another and so on and so on right so this is really the oasis that i'm referring to when you ask about how to survive in cities with a lot of noises like hong kong some of my friends become passionate in cooking during pandemic right we stayed in we cook a lot so they love to touch with five senses the fresh carrots the produce and they also becoming more aware wow actually hong kong has fresh produce back in the days maybe we are not aware of that even and this is their active meditation too mm. so it's always like how far that oasis is from your heart. The shorter the distance, the better. So every time when we are stressed, when we are nervous, we quickly go back into that oasis. So it's like drop into that heart space where which you are, you create yourself. Let's say you come into my class, Delia is only an assistant or a tool. So utilize me and to create your own because everyone is different. Mm. Does that make sense? Oh yes, of course. <laughs> oh gosh, we could keep going and going and going. So many, so many things to converse about. Um, but I will need to wrap us up. And so before I do, um, I will ask you my concluding questions. Um, so usually I do three. And so you, again, you can choose how you like to answer them. The first one is what keeps you grounded. So what keeps Delia grounded? Um, the second one is, and I know this is going to sound like I'm repeating myself when I say, ah, oh, you know, when you were going through those decision making and like, you know, trying to figure out how you, which you've already told us, like, you're like, well, I know what you're asking me, but I didn't really think too much about it. But I guess um, what I wanted to ask was what books or maybe like, um, you know, obviously Dharma Mitra is, is, your, is your teacher and mentor, uh, but what resources would you recommend to other people who, um, you know, that really spoke to you, you know, whether it's something you read that you like reading a lot or you recommend to people to read that planted a seed for you or kind of like, open up like an aha for you of understanding the world, you know, your perspective, uh, you know, entering this path that you've, you've, um, you've been walking on. So that's my second question. The third one is what two cent would you tell listeners who are listening to this episode? And I'm sure many will be your students as well. Um, who probably, you know, who resonate with your storyline or who know you personally, what kind of advice would you um, share with them? Or another way to reverse that question would be like, what would you tell your younger self n like now, like what you know now? Um, so that's like the, the last question. Okay. So keep me grounded. Mm. The first few years as a yoga teacher, I would say, just go onto your yoga mat and breathe and feel your body and meditate every day diligently, okay? And after a few years of now me, I would say you do that, but at the same time, it's also okay not to do that. It, which is also on the flip side of the coin is to, coin is to, to honor the rebellious side of you, okay? So sometimes when you're becoming so disciplined, um, it's almost like a way of saying that you break the rules when you know the rules. Does that make sense? So to keep me grounded, yes, I do meditation every day. I lie on my yoga mat. Sometimes I just lie on my mat for 
like an hour, <laughs> my boyfriend would be like, what actually are you doing with your eyes closed lying on the floor for an hour when he knows, um, obviously I wasn't falling asleep, I wasn't asleep. And I was just like observing, scanning, just feeling, you know, like, to enjoying is almost like a microscope inside me and I go in and to just connect okay and this is a very nice way to to like feel your rib cage so I sometimes I just lie on my floor and to touch my collarbone my thymus to feel how often do you do this not so often so this is like my office but the yoga mat is also my temple and I really really like that and to keep me grounded, I also ask myself every day two questions. The first question is, what do I want in physical reality? Let's say, realistically, this year I'll be launching a pranayama training end of year. I highly likely would be hosting another retreat. Okay, something like that. I'm also teaching in Barcelona Yoga Conference. Those are more on the physical reality part, right? But the second question comes is, what do I want in my spiritual revolution? It can be a big, is a, indeed it's a big question, but you keep asking. Never give up, but you keep asking. And that will bring me closer to closer to my soul truth, right? That soul truth, you are the one who has the key to unlock that. No one can. Right, so I will keep asking this question every day. And the more you ask, you feel, oh, oh yeah, this really is it. And I know, then I will know which decision to make, right? And the second question is the resources. I like Dharma, of course. I really like another spiritual teacher called Ram Das, who used to base in Maui. And I remember I've been listening to his podcast, um, for the longest time, I've been reading his books. I talked about him all the time. I loved his books a lot. I was about to go and apply for his retreat. I think it was just before pandemic. And as soon as I put down that reminder on my calendar, during that year winter solstice, he passed away. So I was like, wow, it's so close, but he's so smart. He's so intelligent that he chose winter sources to pass, right? Um, so he's a, very, he's a very big figure in the world. Um, highly recommend. I also especially like two quotes of him. The first is, we are walking each other home. We have different homes. We can't compare and we also cannot copycat someone but we definitely are here to walk each other home. And the second quote is, oh my God, this is harsh, but I really like it. He said, if you think you are enlightened, please go back to your home and look at your parents for a week or a month. <laughs> so all your lessons are always boiled down to your inner child. And all the lessons always come from your parents because we choose these parents, we choose this womb to be born with. And that also is very in line with my master's in Buddhist studies, which I did in 2017 to 18 in Hong Kong University. Right, and the final question, beautiful question, to talk to my young self, I would say is just keep going and really it sounds really cheesy but really have to listen to your heart and it doesn't matter to be a black sheep you know especially in nation countries it's always challenging and this is the way how we should live and also this is how why life is so beautiful right if it is too smooth it gets boring and there's no lesson to learn so we have to keep increasing and create more space in the heart that space is for you to breathe. And also that space is almost like you go into a yoga class, normally the teacher would say, hey, lengthen and elongate your spine, right? And that space is always the space. I always, Somehow I always have this image. The space represents the space between one vertebra by one vertebra. Is that, that gap 
when you elongate that spine from the spine, you expand your ribcage, then you have more space to breathe. And this is also the space between you and yourself, you between you and also with another person or among others in the society. So that space, you have to really create that. It's like the same understanding of the oasis. Then the creativity will come and the freedom will come. And if you don't have freedom, it's hard to flow. Right? Life is about flowing. It's not about um, conquering or it's not about fighting against something. Everything is perfect in life. Right? So I always feel like it's like dancing. It's like dancing with your partner. It's like ballroom or it's like tennis. You, you hit the ball and the ball will come back to you. So it's like dancing also. Mm -hmm. And that's the flow of life. That's so beautiful, Delia. Okay, we're done. <laughs> I just, I felt it so much. Just uh, your last like five minutes there. It's, uh, it's really hitting home for me. And I'm thinking, oh, what's this pranayama workshop you're doing at the end of the year? I'm going to, I'll put it, once you have it done, yeah, I'm going to share it as well. And uh, I hope to join, I hope to join myself. Um, I want to thank you so much for, uh, making time and for sharing with us. And I don't know if you wanted to um, say anything else before I close off, but I really am so grateful uh, for, I don't know, for having you in my life. It's all right. We only met for like a few times. <laughs> Really, it's really just a few times, but you know, I think that's just the beautiful thing with connecting, you know, and connecting in the heart space. You just never know, and and you know, to your point of Ramdas, we are all walking each other home. It's really part of everyone's journey, you know. And you shared so much today of things I didn't know about you either, um, you know, because honestly, yeah, we didn't really get that much time to really interact in that way. Um, so, you know, it's so beautiful. Uh, and so, you know, I, I just, I, I hope your story, you know, also resonates with those listening and really inspires others, you know, to do whatever it is they need to do to tap into their heart space, right? To to walk their authentic self in, in this life that they live. So uh, yes, I will put your information on the episode resources link below so people can follow you um, so they know what you're offering um, if they're in Hong Kong to, um, you know, take your classes or look into your offerings. And then also um, you'll be at Bar you'll be in Barcelona this year uh, for the Barcelona 10 year anniversary yoga conference. And I'm sure many other things going forward. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So we will um, see you soon. <laughs> Thanks Delia. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for listening to Curito Connects. For more Connects content, collaborations, and discoveries set to inspire you on your own individual journey, please head to our website at www.curito.co. Until next time, stay inspired and thank you for joining us at Curito Connects.